Hi, and welcome. I'm Pastor Matthew here at Bethel Evangelical Missionary Church in Lindsay, and we just call ourselves Bethel Church. We're pleased that you're joining with us today, and a few minutes from now, our live service is going to start, and in the meantime, we're going to show you some announcements that we think will interest you. Our hope today is that as you worship with us, as you listen to the message, that God is going to meet you right where you are and speak directly to your heart. So bless you as you worship with us today. Angels we have heard on high Sweetly singing o'er the plains And the mountains in reply Echoing their joyous strain Oh, 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 oh. In Excelsior 
Joy to the world, the Lord is come, let earth receive her King, let Prepare him room and heaven and nature sing and heaven and nature sing and heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ while fields and floods. Rocks, hills, and plains Repeat the sounding joy Repeat the sounding joy Repeat, repeat the sounding joy Well, good morning. Merry Christmas. Allow me to start today by wishing you and your family a very Merry Christmas. I trust that it will be a time of great joy, of hope, of the love of God and the blessings of peace at this Christmas and always. I wanted to begin the message this way because it is a truly genuine sentiment. From my heart to yours. Some, however, may be evaluating their lives or looking around at the world in turmoil and wonder if true peace could ever be obtained and maintained. Today, with your permission, I would like to address this concept of Jesus being the Prince of Peace. What does that mean, and how do I have his peace? In my life, all I have discovered that many people try different kinds of ways to seek peace, but it still seems to elude them. I submit that never before has the we the world been more sophisticated, more affluent, and more connected, and yet never before has it been more divided, more broken, more in need of a savior. School systems attempt to remove the parent from the sphere of influence in their child. Societal pressure uh, teaches us to embrace the woke thinking, to accept anything and everything, no questions asked. How ironic, isn't it, that we live in a culture that trumpets tolerance and acceptance, yet in reality, we have never been more so intolerant and unaccepting. You know, 120 years ago, the popular sentiment believed that if we could just get the world more educated, all the wars would vanish. 
But you know, since then, we have experienced two major world wars causing the death of over 80 million people. And this happened among some of the most educated nations in the entire globe. Listen, without the transformation of the heart, all education does is help us think of more and more sophisticated ways to kill one another. You know, a change of heart is critical to moving forward, not just an educated mind. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with education. I myself hold a master's degree. But to what degree of the heart that has changed does it matter? You know, there are many brilliant people in prison. And so an educated mind does not necessarily produce a peaceful heart. I declare to you that the world needs peace, but it will never find it apart from Christ. You know, the path to peace through reconciliation, that's how it happens. If there was ever a time in our, need, in our world for people to reconcile, it is today. Reconciliation is the restoration of peace. Peace with God, which leads to the peace of God in your own heart, and then we can have peace with others. You know, peace is the cure for broken hearts and lives. The angels sang in Luke chapter 2 in the Bible, in verse 14, it says this Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. So what I'd like to do in these next couple of moments is look into what it means to have peace on earth. In our day of internet and media and other things, there seems to be a constant barrage of negativity hurled our way. And the result of this often is rudeness or a lack of kindness. There's zero tolerance for anyone who doesn't see it my way. In fact, I can tell you as a pastor, I constantly deal with interpersonal conflicts in marriage, in families, in church, you name it. Even in my own home, we aren't always exempt from conflict. And the sad result of all of this is that this world is literally littered with the debris of countries in conflict, not only with each other, but within their own borders, broken homes and marriages, damaged children, discarded friendship, and the list goes on. Now, you may be thinking, wow, Pastor Ralph, I, I was hoping to tune in today and get, you know, this uplifting, encouraging Christmas message. Well, hold on, it's coming. And I say that because while we can hang on to nostalgia for a little while and, and just uh, dream about things being better. The truth is the world is a mess, but the Lord specializes in cleaning up messes. He's not done. The angel st stated that he would bring peace on earth. We say, well, peace isn't on earth. What's happening? And I say to you, he's not done yet. Maybe this morning you're struggling with brokenness in your own life, in your marriage or your family. Maybe it's a work conflict or conflict with your neighbor. But regardless of the type of conflict, we all want peace. The problem is we just don't know how to go about finding it. You know, I read a psychology and psychology is good. I actually took a course in psychology and on many levels, it teaches us much. It gives us greater insight and all of these things. But this particular psychologist was talking about the best way to relieve stress in our lives is to share it with an unconditional listener. And so they went on to say that the best way to do this is to talk to your pet. Now, as a Christian, as a theologian, as one who who's, knows that really we need to be going to God, saying you're going to a pet just seems rather silly to me. Are you telling me 
that these people who went to that seminar paid good money. The, the grand advice that they had to deal with their stress was to go talk to your hamster. Go have a heart-to-heart -heart with Hammy the hamster. Oh, we know that only God can bring true peace, a release from stress. You know, the Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians 4, he said this, don't worry about anything. Did you hear that? Listen to that. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. One wise person put it this way. He said, there will never be peace in the world until there is peace within nations. And there will never be peace in our nation until there's peace in our communities. And there won't be peace in our communities until there's peace in our families. And there won't be peace in our families until there's peace in our individual lives. And that won't happen until the Prince of Peace reigns in our hearts. So I'm going to suggest to you that the Prince of Peace, we're talking about Jesus himself. The Prince of Peace brings three kinds of peace into our lives. First, Jesus offers us peace with God. Now, there is a natural conflict all of us have with God. You ever thought about that? You ever thought about, like, like I just don't necessarily want to do what God says I should do. We have this conflict. We have this, this like, I think I know it better attitude when it comes to God. And Isaiah says that all we like sheep have gone astray, that we have wandered from God, from what he wanted us to have. And so this unspoken conflict with God is simply this, that we choose to disobey what God told us to do. And the results of this are obvious. The list is long, and the scriptures give a lot of uh, things. But if you are being disobedient to God, here's some of the things that could happen and are part of your life. Maybe irritability, or you have a quick temper, or you're impatient, or you're arrogant to a point, or boasting. Maybe you're holding grudges, just to name a few. These are what the Bible calls the works of the flesh. And you can read more about those in Galatians chapter 5. I mean, have you ever heard anyone say, there's got to be more to life than this? Or sometimes I just think something's missing. And maybe that's even been you. And I'll tell you, what is missing is that you are not at peace with God. You're at odds with him. Now, many people try to remedy those, those feelings of being at odds with God by trying different things, alcohol and drugs, yoga, and they try to do mind meditation and all of these things, but it doesn't deal with the hole in our hearts. It doesn't deal. And some people say, well, I won't do that, but I'll, I'll volunteer. I'll, I'll give money to good causes. But it doesn't address the biggest need that we have, and that is the forgiveness of our sins. We feel guilty before God, and nothing can appease that guilt. Jesus offers us peace with God. He offers a way for us to be reconciled to God, right? Romans 5.10 says, for when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall also be saved by his life. You know, the result of Jesus offering us peace with God, and that's how we do it. When we confess our sins to him and we receive Jesus into our lives, we have peace with God. The war is over in our soul. We are redeemed. We are put into right relationship with him. We are reconciled to God. Do you know, once that happens, it's also true that Jesus, not only does he offer us peace with God, he then offers us the peace 
of God. You see, once you experience peace with God, you will begin to experience the peace of God. Now, you quickly learn to pray and not give in to panic, right? When you have the peace of God, there, there's things that you put into your life and in, into your um, experience that help you experience the peace of God. You come into a, a troubling situation. You find yourself in prayer. And here's the other. There's all kinds of benefits to having the peace of God in your life. You are more patient. You're less pressured. The Bible says in Isaiah 26, 3, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. So if you have the peace of God in your life, you have learned to keep your eyes focused on him, not on the circumstance. Most of us find that we can be easily robbed of peace. Many things can do this, and most of them are beyond our control. But I don't know about you, but I've often tried and been tempted to try harder in, to control the situation, and I almost always fail. It's kind of like, have you ever done this? I, oh, man, this has happened to me way often than I, than I care to admit. You, you lay awake at night. You know you have a busy day the next day. And for whatever reason, you aren't sleeping. So how well does it go over when you simply lecture yourself and say, okay, i got to sleep. I can't stay awake. i got to sleep. i got to go to sleep. The exact opposite happens, doesn't it? And so we struggle with that in our own lives. Listen, the only way to experience the peace of God is to allow God to work through you. You, you can't experience the peace of God by mustering it up on your own. That's the works of the flesh again. And the works of the flesh will always lead you apart from the peace of God. It's only when you allow him to work through you, to allow his spirit to guide you through a situation. And uh, this is what I call the intangibles of the Christian faith. Peace. Someone has peace, true peace in the midst of turmoil. Listen, only God can give you that. From God's perspective, listen to this, your problem isn't that big. From our perspective, it's bigger than the mountains. But from God's perspective, he says, I've got this. You see, the path, to peace, the path to the peace of God comes through living and enjoying one day at a time, accepting what cannot be changed instead of worrying about it, then trusting in God's peace and care and wisdom, and then surrendering to the greater purpose that he has for your life. But it's a matter of focus. When you surrender to him, Jesus promises this. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So not only does peace with God come through Jesus Christ, the peace of God comes through our focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. When those two things happen, then and only then, he shows us how to have true peace and make peace with others. And so if Christ is in control of your life, then one of the first areas you should see a difference in is in your relationships. When you get the vertical right, the horizontal, soon follows suit. Peace with God and the peace of God empowers us and enables us to reconcile with people in our lives with which we've had conflict. 2 Corinthians 5.18 says, and all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ and God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. You see, God wants you and I to be peacemakers. Matthew 5 says this, God blesses those who work for peace, for they shall be called the children of God. Now, notice God doesn't say, blessed are the peace lovers. Everybody loves peace. He didn't say, blessed are the peaceable, because peaceable people are rarely disturbed by anything. So what does it mean to be a peacemaker? 
Well, to begin with, it doesn't mean avoiding conflict. It's not running from a problem and pretending it doesn't exist. Because here's the truth of the matter. When you delay dealing with a conflict, it only grows larger and deeper. And while I'm at it, let me say this. That peacemaking isn't appeasement either. You know what I mean, don't you? That person who is always giving in and allowing other people to always get their way. That isn't peacemaking. That's passivity. You know, I have looked the Bible over from cover to cover. And I have never seen it anywhere where it says, blessed are the doormats. Jesus was a peacemaker, but he certainly wasn't a doormat. He never let anyone define who he was. To be a peacemaker means that you actively seek to end conflicts. You take the initiative of promoting reconciliation wherever and whenever possible. You offer forgiveness to those who have hurt you. So quickly, let me explain that there is a difference between reconciliation and resolution. Reconciliation ends hostility, but it doesn't mean that you've solved the problems of the relationship. Okay? You understand that? Reconciliation ends hostility, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you've solved the problems of the relationship. One person put it this way. He said, you bury the hatchet, but not the issues. There's a big difference between forgiveness and trust. Forgiveness deals with the past. When you forgive someone, you are really setting yourself free from that situation. To not forgive is to prevent your heart and your mind from the ability to have peace in that situation. It never goes away. And while forgiveness takes care of the past, trust is a different matter. Trust is all about the future, and it comes over time. You know, maybe you've been hurt by someone. Forgiving them is a must, but trusting them is something that must be earned over time. And so today, we've talked about Jesus being the peacemaker. The peace with God, the peace of God, and peace with others. And with that peace with others comes forgiveness and trust. Those are not easily dealt with, but are necessary if we're going to have peace with others. Now, maybe this Christmas you've discovered that your current soul condition is actually putting you at odds with God. You are his enemy. And God is offering you the ability to make your peace with him. It starts with confessing to him and your sinfulness, and asking for his forgiveness. It's putting your faith in the finished work of Jesus. And maybe you're a follower of Jesus today, but when you look at your life, our culture, and the condition of the world around us, you find yourself anxious and overwhelmed. And God wants you to experience the peace of God. Peace that passes all understanding. If you're not experiencing that, ask yourself, have I taken my eyes off of Jesus? It's a matter of focus. And then maybe today, you've made your peace with God and you have the peace of God. Then and only then can you truly have it in you to have peace with others. God wants you to have peace, relational peace. Seek him today. Seek him today. You know when the angels sang in Luke 2.14, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward man? That's what he was talking about. Peace with him, peace of him, and peace with others. So my prayer for you is that you would truly experience the peace with God today. If you need to Ask Jesus into your heart. Do that right now. Don't waste another moment. Just bow your head and say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died for the sin, my sins. And I ask you to forgive me of my sins. And I receive you as my Lord and my master. It's as simple as that. That's the starting point. 
That's the seed that God wants to put in your life. The Bible says if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so tell somebody. If you receive Jesus, tell somebody. I asked Jesus in my life. And then he wants you to have the peace of God. Oh, Christian, don't wait another day, not another moment of being in turmoil. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And then seek to have peace with others. Are there people in your life that you're at odds with? It is time. It is time. Seek them out. Be a peacemaker and see what God would do. And so I say to you, myself and Kim, Pastor Matt and Karen, wish you the true joy of Christmas and peace of God today in your lives. God bless you. Thank you for listening. We will see you next week. Wow, what a service. Isn't it great when God meets us right where we're at and speaks to our heart? If you have any questions about what you heard here today or if you would like prayer, you can get in touch with us through our website, BethelAlive.ca, and go to the contact tab and fill out there and send it off to us. We'd be happy to answer any questions and pray with you and pray for you. We would love to see you here. If you're able to make it out in person, it would be great to meet you. Have a coffee with us downstairs in our cafe. In the meantime, God bless you and have a fantastic week.